Amen. Okay, so chapter 11, verse 1. We finished the last year off. Uh, we've had a few weeks of Christmas uh, goings on, Christmas sermons in Mary's Magnificat. But we finished last year, chapter 10, and so we find ourselves now in Matthew chapter 11. As we finished last time, we note, just to note for context, I know some of you weren't here, so I just want us to all be on the same page. As we've been going through Matthew's Gospel, we are building up to the centre point of Matthew's Gospel, which is so crucial and everything revolves around it, which is chapter 12. Now we're coming up to chapter 12, we're going to hit it in the next few months, and chapter 12 is crucial, because throughout the Gospel in the first half, Jesus is coming and saying, repent, Israel, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And all of Israel knows what that kingdom is. They've been reading about it in their Old Testament, in their Jewish Bible, for centuries. They know that there is a promise that the Jewish Messiah is going to come to the Jewish people and establish a Jewish kingdom in the Jewish nation that will extend to the entire planet. That's what's been promised. It's the promise of Isaiah, it's the promise of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and of Daniel and of all the minor prophets. It's something that is just ubiquitous right the way through the Old Testament. And so when Jesus comes and he says, repent, because that kingdom is now within your reach, people understand what he's saying. And Matthew has given us a gospel that is the most Jewish of all the gospels that presents Jesus as the Jewish Messiah who has come to establish his kingdom, to become their king here on earth. And, And the question, and obviously no spoilers here, but we know from hindsight The question is, are they going to accept that offer? Are they going to say, yes, you are our king, let's make you our king? And Matthew 12 is the culmination of that. So at this point in the gospel, we're still at the time where the kingdom is being offered. And it's so important that the kingdom is offered, and there's so little time for it to happen, that Jesus has now enlisted the help of his 12 disciples, and he said to them, I am going to give to you the authority that is mine, <clears throat> so that you can do the things that I've been doing. You're going to be able to cast out demons. You're going to be able to heal lepers. You're going to be able to give sight to the blind. You're going to be able to do all of these things. And as you do so, rather than people misunderstanding and thinking that you're also claiming to be the Jewish king, the Jewish Messiah, <clears throat> that you'll be able to say, no, we are representatives of Jesus and we are his disciples and we are like him urging you to repent so that you can have a part in the kingdom. <clears throat> because, and this has been a huge backdrop to the whole of Matthew, the current Jewish religious leadership were teaching a false gospel. They were saying to all of Israel, you're a Jew, you're okay, you're in the kingdom. Or to put it in their own words, all Israel has a share of the kingdom to come. And Jesus and John the Baptist before him come along and they say to the Pharisees, no, you have to repent or else even you won't be in the kingdom. John goes further and he says, you're a brood of vipers. Jesus goes further, and in the Sermon on the Mount, as we saw, he was basically saying, not only are they not a picture of righteousness, they're actually a picture of unrighteousness. They twist and use the law, checking boxes to say, yes, I've done what's required, while never truly being saved, and never pursuing, and never hungering and thirsting after righteousness for righteousness' sake. But rather, they want to be seen to be righteous in the eyes of men. And so that's the backdrop and that's the situation that we find ourselves in. And chapter 10 in particular that we've spent you know, about a month or so going through, in chapter 10 we found that this was the sending out and we had an entire chapter of the disciples being sent out. A commission. Off you go, you have my authority, go and do those things. And it's a very different commission to the one that we have at the end of Matthew's Gospel, as we noted. It wasn't saying go to all nations, go to all the Gentiles. It's saying go to Israel. Because Israel still hasn't formally rejected the offer of their king. That's coming in chapter 12. So now in chapter 11, we, as you have a look with me now, we're not going to do many verses today. Some of you who are regulars will note that in verse 5 we have capital letters, and you'll be, oh, capital letters, I know what Anthony's going to do there. So we'll come to that in a minute. But 
if we look through this, we have questions from John the Baptist, if I read the headings in, in the, in, you'll have in your pew Bibles. And then in verse 7, Jesus' tribute to John the Baptist. And so there's a whole long section now. For the next few weeks, we're going to be dealing with John the Baptist. John, who came, proclaimed the same message, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when we look at this today, we're looking at John the Baptist in the context of the disciples have been sent out. Now, this is our last thing contextually before we get into the text. This is really important. If you've been following with us to this point in Matthew's Gospel, you know that there has been much rejection of Jesus and much acceptance of Jesus. But much of the acceptance, we're not really sure how genuine that is because people are following him. There's crowds who are coming because he's doing these amazing things, right? Of course there's going to be crowds. But at the same time, What's been going on in chapter 10 is we've been dealing with the issue of true discipleship. Been dealing with that from chapter 9. And the issue is, just because you follow Jesus in the sense of you're a member of the crowd, doesn't mean that you follow Jesus in the sense that you're a disciple. And it's this widespread rejection of the full message of Jesus. And we find this in the world today, don't we, around us? That people are happy with a little bit of Jesus, but what they don't want to have to do is to repent. I want Jesus, but I want to have my favorite sin. I want Jesus, but I don't want to have to change my mind on this because I'm pretty sure I'm right. I want Jesus in the sense that I want him to save me, but I'm not willing to bow the knee and say, my life is yours, my goals are yours, my future is yours, my, my will and my ways and my desires, they're all yours. Take them, use them, do as you wish. I am your slave and I am your servant. And, and the passages that we've been seeing in Matthew does not allow for someone to say, well, I'm a Christian and I've got my ticket to go to heaven, but my life's my own and, and you know, can't believe everything you read in the Bible and stuff like that. There's, there's no place for that at all. So it's in the context of this widespread rejection of Jesus by his people that this next passage comes. Now it happened that when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. So now there's 13 of them going out. One of them we know is an unbeliever, Judas Iscariot. And nonetheless, they're preaching the gospel. This just goes to show you can preach the gospel and not be saved. And they're going out and they're doing miracles, just to show you can do miracles and not be saved. And they're going out and doing all of this. And then what happens in verse 2, we kind of dealt with verse 1 at the end of last time. But now when, now when John in prison heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples. And he said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for someone else? Now there's so much here. Let's just start to unpack this. First of all, John the Baptist is the herald. Prophesied in the Old Testament. We will talk more about that next time. John the Baptist is the herald for the king. What happens to the herald is going to happen to the king. John the Baptist, he goes and he makes proclamations for the people to repent for the kingdom is at hand. And the Pharisees came to observe him, but they didn't answer him back. Why? Because the Pharisees had a protocol that said if someone might be the Messiah, if there's a movement that is significant, it might be messianic, you need to go and investigate. But stage one of that investigation is just observation. That's how John the Baptist says, you brood of vipers, and they didn't answer him back. What then later happens is that Jesus begins his ministry and they go and observe him, and he, they don't answer him back. Then later, John the Baptist, in his ministry, he will be doing his ministry, and then there will be a response, and later for Jesus, there will be a response. And then later, John the Baptist finds that he is in prison, and at the end of Jesus' ministry, he is in prison, and then John the Baptist's ministry ends with his life being taken, and in a sense, although I know I'd rather say Jesus gave his life up, but from a human perspective, 
it ends with Jesus' life being taken as well. What happens to the herald also happens to the king. So John the Baptist is now in prison. He's in prison, he's done his job, he's led the way for Jesus, and he's now been put in prison, whereas Jesus and the disciples are continuing the work. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Taking the message to Israel. Now, the question that John has in prison, he sends via his disciples, is, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for someone else? Are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the king? I take so much comfort from this. Jesus says of John the Baptist, he's the greatest of the Old Testament saints. John the Baptist was the last prophet of the Old Covenant. John the Baptist was the greatest. John the Baptist was a man whose ministry, I can safely say, none of us will ever have a ministry like it. None of us will replicate that. He was once in history the forerunner to the coming of the Messiah at his incarnation. The ministry of his first coming. Now, if that man cannot be sure, I don't think that we can expect to live a life without occasional doubt. Are we in agreement on that? Does that not seem reasonable to you? That if John the Baptist is there and he's in prison, he's saying, "Are are you really the one? then I think I'm going to take an approach in my life where I'm going to be gentle with people who come to me. And they're not rebellious. It's not like they're there proud saying, I don't want to accept what God says. But someone who genuinely is struggling and genuinely has doubts, there are much, much greater people who have gone before them in that. It's understandable. But I believe there's answers for them as well, just like there was for John. And look at the context. And at first glance, this is a little strange. Because he says, when John is in prison, he heard, and we're going to come back to that word later, but he heard of the works of Christ. <clears throat> and that's why he asked the question. Because he heard about the works of Christ. Now, you would think that that would be the opposite, wouldn't you? He hears about the work. He's in prison. Oh, my gosh, what's going on outside? Well, Jesus is doing all these amazing works. Oh, fantastic, he was the Messiah. No doubt there. Fantastic. I was a little unsure, but now I've heard the works he's doing, so now we're good. That's what you'd expect. But yet the text seems to say the opposite. It's as if the works that Jesus was doing caused his doubt. How could that be? And I think that that only sounds strange to us because we don't know our Old Testaments well enough. And that's why I began today by talking again about the Old Testament expectation of the king coming to establish his kingdom on Mount Zion. That expectation colours the entirety of not only Matthew's Gospel, but the entire New Testament. That's what was expected. And so Jesus is coming. John the Baptist knows his job. He's been in the wilderness. God's prepared him. He's a prophet. He gets to speak on behalf of God. And he gets to say, this one who comes after me is mightier than I. This is the one whose whose laces I'm not fit to tie. I'm not fit to do anything in the eyes of this one. I am nobody compared to him. He is the Messiah. Behold, John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew he was the Messiah. He proclaimed him as the Messiah. Right? Right? So what does John think the Messiah is going to do? Well, the Old Testament tells us what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to establish his kingdom. That's the reason for the confusion. The confusion is, is like, what's Jesus doing out there? Well, he's healing people. That's great. That's fantastic. He's healed a leper. Oh, that shows everyone that he's the Messiah. Has he, has he had the temple? Take, has he had the temple take over yet? Have, have the Romans left? Do we, do we have a kingdom? Has he been crowned as king yet? Is he sitting on his throne yet? What's going on? Now, surely all the people of Israel have said, Hallelujah, it's our king. We've waited for century after century after century after century for the Messiah to come. And now we, this generation of Israel, we are the ones privileged to see the arrival of our king. 
Are, are they excited? Well, it's not really happening like that. So what's going on? He's healing the sick. He's giving sight to the blind. This is the reason for John's confusion. If Jesus is the messianic king, why is he not on his throne? Why have the people not accepted him? He came and expected to do a ministry and he expected Israel to repent and the kingdom to be established. I think one of the problems when young men first go into pastoral ministry, I remember I became a pastor in my 20s, much younger man. And when I first went into pastoral ministry, I thought, well, here I am, I've got this opportunity, I've been, I've been uh, ordained, I've been sent out to plant a church, I've got these people with me, we're starting this church, we found this great building, God's provided for this and that, and fantastic. And I thought, well, in a year, this is going to be awesome. And two years... Wow, it's just going to be amazing. There is this sort of implicit expectation that we have sometimes. And I think we all have it in our lives. That if we're going to be faithful, you know, there you are, January the 1st. I'm going to be a, the, the, the most amazing Christian this year. I'm going to devote my life to Jesus like I've never devoted my life to Jesus before. I'm going to put aside all my desires and all my wants, all my goals. I'm going to live for him like never before. And then you get to, you get to February and there's some terrible diagnosis. Or you get to March and then you're in this financial crisis. That, that things don't go your way. And you're like, but I was faithful. And I think John is beyond that. He's not just expecting to be blessed for his faithfulness. He has a biblical expectation of what the Messiah is going to do. And that's why he's there saying, so what's going on? This isn't what I expected. And so the question is, are you, and again, it's, it's a message through the disciples, his, John's disciples, are you, Jesus, the one? Are you the Messiah? Or go, are we going to look for someone else? Have I somehow got this wrong? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the report to go back, go and report to John what you hear and see. Here we go. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. There is so much Old Testament tied up here that that's where we're going to spend the remainder of our time. There are quotations here, and you'll see, and we don't turn there yet, don't, don't jump ahead of me. But don't turn there yet, but you'll see if you have any cross-references in your Bible, which I think some of you do, that the, the first uh, segment that's in bold, the blind receive sight, is a quotation from Isaiah 35 and verse 5. And if you're reading that in your Bible now, you'll see an F that's following. 35 verse 5 in the following verses. And then the, the next chunk that's in capital letters, poor have the gospel preached to them, these capitals indicate Old Testament quotations, and this is a quotation from Isaiah 61 and verse 1. They're both quotations from Isaiah. And before we turn to Isaiah, and we are going to, all right, before we turn to Isaiah, and by the way, if you're visiting, whenever we see capital letters, it's Old Testament, and whenever we see them, we turn there. Because he's pointing us to a context, and we need to understand the context. But before we turn to Isaiah, I want us to understand why he's pointed to Isaiah. Isaiah points to the king and the establishment of his kingdom on the day that he comes and he establishes his throne. That's what Isaiah points to. It's Isaiah that is giving John expectations that Jesus hasn't yet met. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like you had expectations of Jesus that he didn't met? He didn't meet, rather? Do you ever feel like you expected things to go differently? You didn't expect to have this trial or this trouble or this difficulty? John's in the same boat. And it may not be a sinful thing. It may not be that you are having some sinful desire that is not being met. But Jesus is God. He's sovereign. He gets to determine 
what happens and we don't. And John's expectation is not going to be met. And he's expecting it from Isaiah, as I say. But the answer to him is also in Isaiah. So essentially what's happening here, if I can put it this way, is Jesus is giving John an advanced lesson on Isaianic theology. He's, he's, he's taking his understanding of Isaiah, and he's not... Notice Jesus doesn't say, John, you got it wrong. I'm not establishing the kingdom now. Why would you get that? What he does do, though, is he points him to other things to show him that there is a bigger picture. So we're going to do that now. Don't turn to either one of these passages yet, but let's turn to Isaiah 1. We will, in the next short period of time, do the entire book of Isaiah. Kind of kidding. (laughs) Kind of kidding. But we need to look at Isaiah. And by the way, Isaiah is... The crown jewel of the Old Testament. If you don't understand Isaiah, you don't understand your New Testament as well as you should. Isaiah is just the most incredibly important book. It is structured beautifully. It is majestic in its writing. We at this church, we spent over two years doing the first half of Isaiah. We did the first 39 chapters. We will come back to the second half at some point. But... It's a majestic book, and it's always worth your time to to examine and to look at. But if you're all there now in Isaiah 1, I just want you to notice a few things. As we start the book in Isaiah, there is a vision of Isaiah, and right from the off, this is what it says. What's the first word of Isaiah's vision? Isaiah, he's having this vision, he's the son of Amos, it's concerning this, it's in the days of these kings, right? What's the first word of the vision? Hear! Hear, O heavens! Give ear, O earth, for Yahweh speaks. Sons I have reared and raised up, they have transgressed against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not perceive. That is your foundation for the whole book of Isaiah. Isaiah starts off and he says, Israel, listen, hear, pay attention. You need to hear. And then he presents the the situation. The situation is, you are worse than animals. You're worse than smelly animals, Israel. Because a smelly animal, like a donkey, knows its master's manger. But what you don't, is you don't know. You don't know what you should know. So he's saying you need to hear, so that you know. And how do we know that Israel don't hear? And how do we know that they don't know? What's the evidence for Israel not hearing and not knowing? They don't obey. And the first five chapters of Isaiah is absolutely full of expression of Israel's disobedience. You need to hear God so that you know what God is saying, that you might obey God. And then you throw into that mix the concept of knowing being more relational as well. But there's this word hear. They need to hear. They don't hear. And so with that said, let's turn to chapter 2. Chapter 1, oh man, I wish I could preach all chapter 1 again. Chapter 1, go look it up on the website. I've done, there were, I think, four or five sermons in chapter 1. Chapter 1 is a, is a foundational beginning of Isaiah and an absolute, complete condemnation of Israel and their sin, and in particular their idolatry. And then we come to chapter 2, another vision. This is the word... Isaiah, son of Amos, beheld concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will be that in the last days, the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the head of the mountains. It will be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us from his ways, and we may walk in his paths. If you see the connection there to Psalm 1, you're supposed to. And if you see the connection to Psalm 2, you're supposed to. The word of Yahweh, uh, sorry, from Zion the law will go forth and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. They will judge between the nations. They will render decisions for many people. They will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. Having done the most complete destruction 
of Israel, condemned them, spoken against them, called on them to repent because of their sin. God then says, but anyway, I'm going to do this. (laughs) It's just classic Old Testament. You've been absolutely terrible. You are the worst. You deserve nothing. New chapter. I'm going to really bless you. That's just the nature of our God, isn't it? And God, and, and what the promise is, is, and this is one of countless passages in the Old Testament, that the king is going to have his kingdom on Mount Zion, that Yahweh himself is the mountain of Yahweh. It's a house of, the house of the God of Jacob. And they're going to go to Yahweh. Again, by the way, this is another passage that indicates that the one on the mountain on the throne is himself Yahweh. And yet, Psalm 2, the one on the throne is Yahweh's son and his anointed one. Who's on the throne? Is it Yahweh or is it his son? Is it Yahweh or the anointed one, the Messiah? And the answer, of course, is yes. Because the son is Yahweh. He is God. The the Trinity exists in the Old Testament in embryonic form. It's there. So, so God is going to be on his throne and people are going to come and the nations, that's the Gentiles, are going to come and worship him. And when this happens, folks, has it happened? Has it happened in a sort of spiritual sense? No, that's not what it's saying because when this happens, there'll be no more war. And if you try and spiritualize that, which some people try, it's like, how can you, at the first week of January, say that there is spiritually no more war? Did, did you not have family over at Christmas? I mean, surely there was a little bit of, you know, tension here and there. So my point is this, that there's this promise that the king is going to come and have his kingdom and there's going to be no more war and all the nations and all the people on the planet, although he is a Jewish king and he is the Jewish God, all the nations will come and worship him. And there'll be no more conflict and there'll be no more war. That's it, done. We're now in the time of peace. You get to the end of Isaiah, and it's talking about the same kingdom, and you have that famous expression of the lying, lying down with the lamb. That this is going to spread to all creation, this peace. That he is truly the prince of peace, establishing a kingdom of peace. This is what's coming, right? This is what John expected. How on earth are Israel going to go from idolatry to this place? The answer is they have to hear so that they can repent. So let's follow this theme through. When we get to Isaiah 5, trying to move quicker now, Isaiah 5, you have the song of the vineyard. Now in chapter 4, there's another reference to the kingdom. You can leave that for your own time. And in chapter 3, there is more condemnation. And in chapter 2, there was more condemnation. So when we're keeping a score here, it's sort of condemnation, you know, I'm British, so bear with me with my British football scores. But it's a thrashing, what we would call in England. It's like a, it's like condemnation seven, promises two. It's that kind of scoreline, you know. It's, it's not even. And then we come to chapter five, and now it's just going to be completely ridiculous because it's going to be even more condemnation. And there is a story of the vineyard. Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song, my beloved, concerning, concerning his vineyard. And I'll just give you a brief summary. God tells the story of a vineyard. The vineyard is planted. It's in good land, good soil, good fruit, good support, good uh, structure around it. Everything is in place. If there was ever going to be a vineyard that was going to produce good, wonderful fruit, it's this vineyard. Everything is good and everything is right. And then the harvest comes. And the fruit is rotten. It's disgusting. It's inedible. And the question and the point of the Song of the Vineyard is this. What would you do, Israel? What would you do? What would you do if it was your vineyard? If you've put all of this time and all of this effort and everything is right, there's nothing you could do better because it's all been done perfectly. What would you do if that was your vineyard? And I think the answer for any of us would be pretty simple. Well, I wouldn't bother doing it again. I'd rip it up. I'd burn it. I'd be done with it. And that's what, the, that's what happens. And the fact that it's God becomes clear, because not only is there going to be no help, no growth, no watering, he says, we're not even going to give you rain from the sky. This is God's vineyard. He can do that kind of stuff. In other words, God blessed Israel. Israel didn't hear, so Israel didn't know him, so Israel didn't obey him, and as such, they produced dirty, rotten fruit, and so God says, that's it, I'm not helping you anymore. And then we have 
the most glorious condemnation of Israel here. Well-known passages, you've called good evil and evil good, and all of that stuff is in chapter 5. Then we come to Isaiah 6, turn the page. Isaiah 6, very well-known passage. What happens in Isaiah 6? In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Who's sitting on a throne? It's the Lord. Is it, is it Yahweh or is it his son? Yes. High and lifted up with the train of his robe filling the temple. Where is this temple? Lots of people say heaven. I would argue it's on earth because all the context of chapter 2 has been that the temple is in Mount Zion on earth. And you have holy, holy, holy. And I love that passage. I could talk, talk about it all day long, but I'm going to be very self-disciplined here and take you to the end of that passage where Isaiah has been cleansed by the burning coal and now we have God saying, who shall I send? And Isaiah, now cleaned, now cleansed, by, and now atoned, his sins been atoned for. And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And this is what God says. Verse 9. He said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing. I'm emphasizing that for a reason. But do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not know. In other words, hey guys, you get to hear, but you're never going to understand. You're going to, to see, but you'll never know what you see. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. That to me is one of the most shocking passages in scripture. It's saying, Isaiah, I've got a job for you. I need you to go and be my, my prophet to speak for me. Absolutely, I got it. I'm going. This is what you've got to do. You've got to preach in such a way that nobody understands and nobody hears, nobody sees. Because if they did understand and hear and see, if they, if they got it, if they believed it, they'd repent. And we can't be having that. Is that not shocking to you? That should be shocking to you. But it only makes sense in the context of chapter 5. He gave them everything and they didn't believe there was no good fruit, so why would he bless them now? So they have, because of their sin, they have been assigned a judicial blindness. And this exact passage, we're going to see quoted by Jesus in chapter 13. But we'll come to that when we come to that. But it is to say that God has decreed that Israel will not be blessed they will not see there is a judicial blindness and they will not, key word, hear. Then Isaiah says, Lord, how long? And he says, until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is devastated to desolation. And Yahweh has removed men far away and the forsaken places are in the midst of the land and there will be a tenth of a portion in it and it will be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. That last section is for what we need to understand today. It's a complex section. Again, it's all on the website. We talked through this. But what it's saying is that this blindness will not come to an end until Israel has been devastated and destroyed. And that happened with the destruction, in 70, uh, the destruction of the Babylonians and they were taken into captivity. And then they come back from captivity. And are they still blind when they come back from captivity? Well, if you've ever read the book of Esther, uh, Ezra or Nehemiah, you know they couldn't have been blind. Because they're like, they're like a people woken from their blindness. It was like, what's this in the law? What's this law thing? This is amazing. We should be doing this. They're hearing and they're knowing and they're obeying. So the blindness was what led them into captivity and then they came out of captivity, and this has now ended. And that last verse, when it talks about oaks and terebinth, is, is talking about the things they use to make their idols. The idolatry is going to be quashed. And what's interesting is, though the Jewish people continue to sin and continue to rebel against Yahweh throughout their history subsequent to their captivity, they never got involved in idolatry on the same scale ever again. Captivity cured their idolatry problem. Now, all of that then leads us... And I'm going to have to be very brief in this, but rush ahead to chapter 29. Chapter 29. Now we're starting to get to some of the important parts. 
Chapter 29 and verse 18. On that day, the deaf will hear words of a book. And out of darkness and thick darkness, the eyes of the blind can see. Isn't that wonderful? The, the verse before us is not just a little while before Lebanon will turn to a fruitful orchard and the fruitful orchard will be counted to a forest. He's talking about a time of restoration. He's talking about the coming of the kingdom. And Isaiah does this the whole way through. Condemnation, kingdom. Condemnation, kingdom. Condemnation, kingdom. All the way through Isaiah. And what Isaiah is doing here is he's using kingdom terminology. <clears throat> when he says on that day, the expression on that day refers to the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is the time, it's not Sunday by the way in case you're from those traditions. The day of the Lord is the day when the Messiah comes and brings great trial and hardship to, or rather, God brings great trial and hardship to the earth. And then the Messiah comes and establishes his kingdom. The day of the Lord is the trial and the darkness followed by the king and his kingdom. At least the establishing of the kingdom. That's the day of the Lord. And he says, on that day, what's going to happen? The deaf will hear the words of a book. Why is that significant? Because Israel were told, you won't be able to hear. You won't be able to understand. You're not going to be able to see. The other expression, out of the darkness and thick darkness... There are passages in the scriptures where, in the Old Testament, where the day of the Lord is described as a day of darkness. Thick darkness. I think that's Obadiah, but I haven't got it written down, so don't quote me on that. But it talks, no, uh, Zephaniah, day of great darkness. And that's the day of the Lord, it's a day of darkness. And he says, out of that darkness, when that day comes to an end, out of the darkness of the day, the eyes of the blind will see. Do you see that? Now let's move on a little bit. Let's go to chapter 30. Chapter 30, verses 9. Uh, let's start. For this is a rebellious people. False sons. Sons who are not willing to listen or hear. You see, we've still got this concept of hearing and seeing, but we're going from promise of the future to condemnation toing and froing verse 11 get out of the way turn aside from the path cease speaking to us about the holy one of israel they don't want to hear about god they're people who can't hear who are now judicially rejecting him don't tell us about god let's go to chapter 32 chapter 32 when we begin chapter 32, you can see we've gone from condemnation back to blessing again. Behold, a king will reign righteously. This is what John the Baptist is expecting. The king has come. He knows Jesus is the king. He's going to reign. And princes will rule justly. And each will be a refuge from the wind. That's, a, that's an allusion, by the way, to um, Psalm 2. Blessed are those who take refuge in him, referring to the king. A shelter from the storm. That's a reference to Bob Dylan. No, just joking. Um, like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in a weary land, then, when the king reigns, then the eyes of those who see will not be blinded, and the ears of those who hear will pay attention. Same stuff. Now we go to chapter 35, and this is what the first of the two passages that Jesus quotes to John. Chapter 35. If you get to chapter 35, you see the heading is the joy of the redeemed. So you know what's coming. It's another future promise passage. There's going to be good times. Wilderness, the desert will be delighted. There's going to be flourishing, verse 2. Rejoicing, verse 2. The majesty of the glory of God. They will see the glory of Yahweh. <clears throat> Strengthen limp hands, verse 3. Give courage to the knee of the stumbling. Say to those with an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, and the recompense of God will come, and he will save you. And then, then, the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. That is the phrase that John is quoted by Jesus. John the Baptist in a prison cell. <clears throat> You're supposed to be the king. What's going on? This isn't what I expected. What's happening? And Jesus says, tell him this. 
Go tell him this. Tell this great prophet, who, by the way, would have known the book of Isaiah off the top of his head. He would have known the book of Isaiah better than teenage girls know Taylor Swift lyrics. Right? That's how well he'd have known the book of Isaiah. And he'd have known it so well. And Jesus says, go tell him this. And you stay in Isaiah, please. Don't turn with me. But he says, tell them that the blind receive their sight. He's quoting from here. On that day, then, the eyes of the blind will be opened. The deaf, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Why am I making such a point about this? Because throughout the book of Isaiah, blindness and deafness are analogies for people who are spiritually blind and deaf. And Israel were condemned in the time of Isaiah to judicial blindness. Now Israel are being told, listen, hear, repent. Why? Because in chapter 13, there is going to be judicial blindness for those who don't listen. You've got to listen. But why this passage? I mean, there's tons, I've shown you loads. There's tons of passages in Isaiah alone that says the blind will see, the deaf will hear. Why this one? Look at the verses before it. Even in the context of the glory of the kingdom, it says, strengthen limp hands. How do you think John's hands were in the prison? Strong and bold? Doesn't sound like it. Give courage to the knees of the stumbling. Do you think John was stumbling in prison? Sounds like it. Say to those with an anxious heart, are you the one? I mean, are you? Have they got it wrong? Is it somebody else? Be strong. Fear not. Your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come. Hey, John, don't worry. It's going to happen. God is going to come and he will bring his vengeance and he will judge the nations. And all the Old Testament stuff that was supposed to happen at the end of the day of the Lord, it will happen and the kingdom will be established. I will do it. That will come. But he will save you. Before Jesus comes to judge, he'll come to save. Before the final judgment, before he's there in the valley of Jehoshaphat, separating the sheep from the goats at the end of the day of the Lord to establish his glorious kingdom, before that he saves. And then when that happens... He says the eyes of the blind will be opened. Does that mean that miracles will be done to those who are physically blind? Yes. But does it in the context of Isaiah also mean that the day is coming when all will see? Yes. So why is this context so crucial? Because what Jesus is saying to John is, come on, pal, be strong. You know there's a time of judgment that's got to come. You know there's got to be the day of the Lord. And then the kingdom will be established. And when it is established, the eyes will be opened. But what am I doing right now? I'm showing that I am the one that can open eyes and open ears. That's what I'm doing now. I'm showing you that I am the one who will do this stuff at the end. But it's not for now. Take courage. And so if we move on to the other quotation in Isaiah 61, and and again, stay in Isaiah, but as he goes through, he says, the blind receive sight, Isaiah quotation, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. When we dealt with the cleansing of the leper, remember, we said that that was a messianic miracle that the Pharisees taught that only the Messiah would be able to do. There is an entire chapter of Leviticus that is only telling you one thing. This is what you must do when a leper is healed. And that had never been used in Jewish history. And then Jesus comes along and heals lepers. Only the Messiah could do that. So, he says, uh, stay in Isaiah, he says, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And that's a quotation from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the the Yahweh has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. You might think, well, that's not the same verse, but good news is the gospel. Have the gospel preached them. Gospel means good news. And poor and afflicted are different ways of translating the same Hebrew word. And we talked about this before. I won't get into it too much today. But 
to be poor in Isaiah's eyes, if you're poor financially, if you're poor materially, probably better, if you're poor materially, you realize you don't have anything. We said this last week. If your car breaks down, I don't know how I'm going to fix it. I've got no money. You, you lack. Spiritually, if you're poor, you say, I can't do it. I lack. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough for God. And that, friends, is the beginning of repentance. That's why the poor in spirit are blessed, for they shall see the kingdom of heaven. That's Isaianic as well, as we said at the time. So there is good news to those who are afflicted. Now let's just go back then. We've done this, and I could, I could, I've got countless more written down, but we'll call it a day there in Isaiah. Let's go back to Matthew 11. There's, there's a couple of things I want us to see as we, as we close. Two things. Number one, can you see how beautifully Jesus dealt with John the Baptist? He gives him one passage and points him to it, which is a passage that speaks to those who are anxious, those who are lacking courage, those who are feeling weak. And he points to that passage and he says, hey, those people in that situation, don't you worry, God is going to keep his promises. When you find someone doubting, friends, or when you're the one doubting, go to scripture, see the promises of God, and take courage. What a great passage for Jesus to point John the Baptist to. And the second passage he points him to is he points them to a passage that reminds him that the good news of the gospel is for those who are afflicted, for those who are poor in spirit. And there is John the Baptist saying, I've done all of this ministry, I've pointed to the Messiah, I thought I did it right, and here I am in prison, and my whole life's crumbling down, and he's going to be dead soon, by the way, and it doesn't look very good for me, he was right, and, and I don't even know if he's the one anymore. And Jesus comes to him and says, It's good news for people who are weak, for people who are poor, for people who are afflicted. It doesn't mean, if you're having a hard time, that God's got good news for you. Because if in your hardship you have a hard heart towards God, then it's very bad news. But the poorness that is being referred to is a poverty of spirit that recognizes our inability, our lack of worth, and says, I'm utterly reliant upon you. And so Jesus is ultimately pointing John through the scriptures to, I'm with you in your weakness, I care for you, and I'm here for you. Trust me, I won't let you down. And this this is good news for you. And see this weakness that you're in as being something that the gospel is for people like you. It's magnificent what Jesus does with the scriptures. If only we could use the scriptures this well, huh? Point people to those right passages at the right time. But the second and final thing that Jesus is doing here is he's showing to him and Matthew through the gospel that He's doing the things that only the Messiah could do. Healing lepers, opening the eyes, opening ears, healing the lame. He's showing that he has the power and the authority, which those who've been coming for however long, this is exactly what we saw in chapter 8 and chapter 9, right the way through. I am the one with the authority to do, to say what I said in the Sermon on the Mount because I have the power to do these things. Jesus is, is saying... You can be sure it's me. And for us as the reader, notice this, and this is where I'll end. When John in prison heard of the works of Christ, yes? Jesus replies and says, go and report to John what you hear and see. Verse 5, the deaf hear. And when he finishes talking about John, and will be there next time, he concludes with verse 15, which is where Debbie read up to us for, uh, read to us up to, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Notice there's a double repetition. He could just say, those who have ears, let him hear. That expression is common in scripture. But he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Repetition is always significant in scripture. What is being said here is this. To John as an individual, don't worry, I'm comforting you in your weakness, I'm the Messiah. To the readers, to us, listen, hear, know, obey, 
Show yourself to be a disciple. Listen to God. Hear his words. Not hearing his words, guys, does not mean coming to church on a Sunday and listening to a sermon. Though that's the beginning of it. Hearing means when you hear the words, you allow it to impact your heart. You allow the Bible to change your views on things and your opinions on things. That you put aside your preconceptions and your selfishness and how you want to live your life and what you want to do and what you want Christianity to be if you could have any decision upon that. You put it all aside and you hear God and you obey God and you give all glory to God. That's the hearing he's speaking about. And so the message here to the readership through Matthew is, do you hear? And this is crucial because we are speeding ahead. Might not feel like fast, but we're speeding ahead to chapter 13, where Jesus is going to say the most horrific thing, which is that the judicial blindness of Isaiah 6 is upon you again. And for those of us who are doing midweek studies in Romans chapter 9 we're currently in, we know that the Jews are currently blinded. They're still under. The the blindness of Isaiah 6, how long did that last? 70 years of captivity. The blindness of Jesus imposing it on them in Matthew 13, how long does that last? Going on 2,000 years and no end in sight. Until the fullness of Gentiles come in. Until the church is complete. And those Jews, can you imagine looking at this with hindsight? Those Jews are being told, hear, listen. And we've only got to turn a few pages and it's too late. They can't hear and listen anymore. Last Christmas... I suddenly felt an urge to go into Wham there, but last Christmas I was in England and went to see my parents. My parents are in their 80s now, they're getting old. Take the opportunities I can to see them. Went and saw my father, he was in good health, and he says, I've got some, someone I want you to meet. And my dad, I mean, 10 plus years after his long, longest term partner, he divorced from my mother when he was, was young, and then he had a uh, they never married, so a sort of common-law stepmother who he was with for longer than he was with my mother. And she passed away from uh, cancer about 10 years previously. And he said, I've got someone I want you to meet. And he had a new lady friend. And so we got to meet her. It's quite exciting. It's not every day you get to meet your father's new lady friend. We got to, to meet her. And she seemed very nice, and she was nice, and we had tea with her, because we're British, that's what we do. We had tea with her, and we had a nice chat, and we spent time with her, and she was lovely. And the next day, we all went to the cinema together. We went to see a movie, and she came as well. It was lovely. And then we said, she said, I'll see you. Because well, I think the day after that, we were going to go to um, to see uh, my cousins and aunt and uncle. And we spent the day with them, and she was there, and it was lovely. And I thought, well, she's a nice lady. I think she's a good fit for my dad. That's nice. Nice to have met her. Bye-bye. And I came back to England, and Jenny stayed a little while longer to spend more time with her, her family and with our, uh, our, our grandson. And while I was back here and Jenny was still in England, I got news that she dropped down dead. This lovely lady in great health, seemingly doing very well, and she was gone, dead, finished. None of you know what tomorrow brings. None of us do. I mean, great, have retirement plans, have a holiday booked. Do all those things. That's fine. Don't, you don't want to go through life like today's is your last day in every sense. But you and I know that we have no guarantee of tomorrow. We have no guarantee of another breath. We're not deserving of another breath. God in his long suffering and his mercy gives us this life. And we have no idea when it's going to end. Not a clue. And that's why the Bible says, listen, hear. Because you have no idea if this sermon today is chapter 11, and by the time you get to chapter 13, it's too late, and judicial blindness comes upon you. You don't know. You might live another 50 years, but you don't know if, if what you're hearing today is something that you will have no opportunity to respond to ever again. You have no idea. 
And this is why in the book of Hebrews, it emphasizes while quoting the Psalms again and again, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. One of Charles Spurgeon's favorite texts. And here we are at the start of a new year. We're back in Matthew. Off we're going to go. We'll be back in the verse 7 next week. And I want to just say to you, today's the day. Today's the day to believe if you haven't believed, to trust, to bow the knee if you haven't done that. Today is the day to say, I am Christ's and I am not my own. I am dead and he lives in me. No more me, him. Today is the day. And if you have done that, today is the day to, to say, okay, I'm going to keep living that way. I'm, not, I'm going to have an even better year as I mature and as I grow in my faith. Now is the time. I'm going to listen. I'm going to hear. Because he's shown who he is, and I know I can trust him. John in that prison cell could trust him, and you and I, with difficulties ahead, with trials ahead, with problems in our life, with things that we want to do, with desires that we have, we can take them all and we can lay them at his feet, and we can trust him. Hear it, all you who have ears to hear. It's a good time to come to his table, isn't it? Should we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for glorifying yourself in your word. May we be people who hear. May we not be dumb and deaf to your proddings and promptings as we stumble and fall, as we disobey, as we compromise. Lord, may we hear, may we listen. And may we trust in you, the one who proved that you were who you said you were. And as we come to your table now, Lord, if we have compromised, if we have lived in this world, for this world, for ourselves, Lord, may we repent right now. May we come to your table clear from the guilt of sin, washed in your blood, ready to rejoice in the forgiveness that we have. May we put aside grudges, May we forgive those who've offended us. And Lord, may we put aside all right that we might think we have to rule and run our own lives. Amen. 